please welcome Christopher Snowden. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming along during lunch. Um, the theme of this talk is state funding for so-called civil society groups. Uh, I'm going to be mainly looking at the EU, but at every national level um, in Europe, I think, certainly in, in the United Kingdom, and I'll give some examples from the UK, uh, but from um, nearly every country um, in, in Europe, there will be direct funding by the state to various third-party organizations. Um, and often these third-party organizations are political in nature, they're pressure groups to a large extent. And um, I'm going to argue that the large-scale funding of political pressure groups distorts the democratic debate, um, that it's a waste of money, and um, that it crowds out genu genuine civil society movements. Um, civil society is defined by the EU itself as being organizations, groups, voluntary, um, voluntary societies that form together on a voluntary basis and are independent from government. And I would say that if an organization is very heavily funded by the government, that it cannot be described as in any way, realistic way as being independent of government. Um, the quote you see up there, it's a genuine Thomas Jefferson quote. I always need to point this out when it comes to Thomas and Jefferson quotes, because there's a lot of fake ones on the internet. This is something he actually did say. Um, and I think this is a pretty good uh, moral basis upon which to proceed, that it's uh, sinful to compel people to uh, give money to um, people or organizations who are going to propagate opinions that they personally find uh, sinful or tyrannical. Theoretical basis for this is really very simple. You may be familiar, if you know public choice theory, um, you may be familiar with the Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle is basically the politician, the bureaucrat, and the pressure group. And uh, in public choice theory, this is how policy is formed in practice. Now, there are two pressures pointing down on the politician, his, his or her political party, um, and the, the voter. But the politician has things that he or she wants to do, the bureaucrats have things that they want to do, and the pressure groups have all sorts of different things that they want to do. The pressure groups may be um, corporate interests, lobbying uh, for rent-seeking policies, tax reductions, uh, looser regulation, whatever it may be, or they may be um, any, any other sort of uh, special interest group that is just interested in any particular thing. They may be anti-abortion, they may be pro-gun control, they may be pro-legalization of drugs, whatever it may be. They, by definition, put pressure on the politician. Um, but so does the political party. So the politician goes into, into government with all sorts of things that they want to proceed with, but they're under constant pressure, both from their electorate every few years and from their political party, with whom they may not agree with everything. Uh, but the politician and the bureaucrat make up the state. Um, I think it's more useful to use the term the state than it is the government. People think, I think, sometimes of the government as being the elected party that's in power or the elected coalition that's in power. In fact, the state is much broader than that. Within the state there, are, there is a huge bureaucracy that is some, to some extent self-interested um, and that is more permanent than any transitional government that comes in and out of power. So the politician and the bureaucrats, they have things in common, they are the state, um, but there's pressure from the pressure groups. Now what I would argue when it comes to state funding of pressure groups is that essentially the politicians and the bureaucrats are taking over the third corner of the triangle. And so the iron triangle becomes overwhelmingly dominated by the interests of the state. And I would further argue that the interests of um, both the politicians and bureaucrats are frequently at odds with the wishes and desires of the majority of people. And that's why, and as I'll, as I'll show over the course of the next half hour, um, that is why the, the kind of pressure groups that get funded by the state tend to be working and interested in areas which are not um, of popular interest. Um, why, why would there need to be? If, if uh, the overwhelming majority of the population were in favor of a particular policy, you would just bow to their will and get on and do it. What's actually happening with a lot of the state-funded organizations is they're campaigning for things which are of great interest to a political elite, um, but which are often 
uh, opposed by a majority of the population, and hence the need to generate the appearance of grassroots support for certain issues. I don't know if you can see all these figures, um, but hopefully I'll, I can give you a general overview. I've written a report called Euro Puppets, which came out a couple of years ago, all, all to do with EU funding of uh, various organizations. And I give various tables like this, picked almost at random, actually, um, just to give some idea of the extent of, of EU funding for various organizations. Not all these are pressure groups by any means. Many of them have some sort of advocacy arm. Um, some of them are overwhelmingly political, political pressure groups. Some of them are very um, openly, uh, generally left-wing. Um, but some of them are just normal civil society organizations doing good work. It's important with this not to take a judgment of the particular organizations. Some of these organizations you will agree with their cause, some of them you won't. That, that I don't think should be the issue. The issue should be, is it right for the government to pick various winners, give them more money, give them more of a voice. So this particular um, selection of organizations got together in 2013 for the EU's European Year of the Citizen. And this is part of an ongoing project by the EU to engage with civil society. After the very low turnout in the European elections of 1999 and following the um, spate of referendums that went against the EU constitution and other treaties, um, the European Union realized that it needed to stop being such a top-down um, organization. It needed to not be so elitist and technocratic. It needed to engage with the people if it was going to proceed, which sounds a very sensible thing to do. Um, and had they done it, it would have been a very good thing. What they actually did is they found various organizations that, that were to their liking, gave them enormous amounts of money, and then engaged with them as if they represented the whole of civil society. Um, and so you can see here, these organizations got together, evidently on a semi-voluntary basis at least, to promote the idea of European citizenship. Um, and as you can see, most of them take money from the EU. Most of them actually take most, most of their money from the EU. Some of them are taking um, more than 80%, even 90% of their money from the EU, which suggests that if it were not for the EU funding, many of these organizations wouldn't exist at all or if they did exist, they would be extremely small and wouldn't have uh, much of a voice at all. This is the EU Civil Society Contact Group. So this is an umbrella group for umbrella groups. All of these organizations are in themselves umbrella groups which have many members of their own. Um, and you can see the extent of EU funding here as well. So you've got the Public Health Alliance involved with, with public health, the social platform is to do with uh, the social sector, whatever that uh, means, the European Women's Lobby, obviously to do with, with women, Culture Action Europe, um, the arts, uh, UKS is um, uh, lifelong learning, and Concord is foreign aid. Um, all of these organizations get most of their money from the EU. And if you then drill down to see which members are members of these umbrella groups. If we take the example of um, social platform, then again you can see that very few of the members of these umbrella groups are not getting money from the EU. And again, if they are getting money, they're usually getting most of their money from the EU. That's not the full list, there's more there. Uh, and then there's the Green 10, which is the official name for the 10 largest um, environmental organizations in the EU. Um, one of the reasons they're the, most, they're the largest is because the EU gives them so much money. Without the amount of money they get from the EU, they, many of them wouldn't be so large at all. Um, you can see that the scale of funding for these organizations is slightly smaller in percentage terms than some of the others we've seen, um, but still a very significant amount. Friends of the Earth, for example, getting nearly half of their money from the EU. There's only one member of the Green Tent which isn't on there because they don't get EU money, and that's Greenpeace, which has traditionally refused, quite nobly, not to receive money um, from the government in order to maintain its independence. Um, now this is just scratching the surface, I could go on and on, but hopefully you get, you get the picture that uh, the vast numbers of organizations that call themselves civil society groups are getting money from the EU. The implications for this, um, I think these are some of the most important ones. One is, as I say, it, it distorts public debate. So very often you'll be hearing on the radio or on the television 
um, about some proposed piece of legislation. And you'll have an organisation on there very often saying, this is good from the government, or this is good from the EU, but it doesn't go far enough. We think it should go much, much further. Um, and that's because generally they're on the extreme end of the debate. And very often those organisations are actually there uh, able to have such a profile because um, they're getting so much money from the EU. A lot of these organisations are also putting on conferences um, all around uh, Europe on their various, uh, about their various causes. Um, they all have, of course, websites. One of the giveaways that an organisation is in the pay of the EU is they are uh, bound by um, the rules to put the EU flag on there. And you can more or less um, search for any EU organisation under the words environmentalism, social justice, citizenship, this kind of thing. And more often than not, you'll see the European Commission, uh, the European Union flag on there. Another issue is it creates and it entrenches an elite. And so ironically, the effect is actually to crowd out civil society. You've got all these organisations which are given a massive megaphone by the European Union because the money does clearly buy you a much greater profile. Um, and the, yet there are you know, thousands of genuine civil society organisations who by virtue of not being able to compete because they don't have this kind of money or because they refuse this kind of money, um, they are crowded out by the, the much larger and wealthier organisations. And that in itself leads to this distortion of public debate. So you're only hearing from, uh, increasingly you're only hearing from state funded groups. Um, for the groups themselves, there's a loss of, loss of independence. Uh, it's, it, it's inevitable, I think, if, you, if you're taking money from any particular source uh, to an overwhelming extent, um, that there will be th certain things you can't say. It's important to, to say here that all of these organizations believe what they're saying, right? Friends of the Earth passionately believe in what they're saying. Um, the question is, should the government be giving them a megaphone which to say it even louder? Do we even need to have Friends of the Earth, which is mainly state funded, because they're just EU funds I showed you, they also get a lot from the national governments. Do we actually need Friends of the Earth when we've got Greenpeace? Isn't there an oversupply of third party organisations to some extent because they need to keep getting this money from, from the government? But there are clearly some, certain things they can't say. Um, the most obvious one is if they feel a little bit Eurosceptic, if they disagree with the Commission's di uh, direction of travel in terms of integration, centralisation, federalisation, they are disinclined, I would argue, to point this out uh, on any kind of um, regular basis uh, for fear of losing their funding. And then there's the issue of rent seeking. The Economist uh, noted this, this is about 10 years ago, yeah, 11 years ago, the, the Economist looked at the, uh, the extent of state funding from the EU and said the spectacle of organizations that receive EU money using their money to campaign for more EU money is only one example of this looking glass world. It is a world in which so-called NGOs, non-governmental organizations, are actually dependent on government for cash and one in which the European Commission, itself directly fi financed by Europe's national governments, finances autonomous organisations that campaign for more power and money to be handed to the Commission itself. And of all the, um, of all the causes that the European Commission is interested in, the overarching cause is itself, is the European project itself. Um, and when you look at the issue of rent seeking and mission creep, which is endemic to all uh, all special interest groups. You know, there will always be mission creep. If an organization succeeds in one goal, very, very rarely do they decide we, we're, going back, we're going to stop now, brilliant, we've, we've achieved everything we want to do, we'll just go back and get a normal job. They always find something else to do. If you're familiar with Manka Olson's The Logic of Collective Action, um, a classic public choice um, publication from the 60s, he looks at this um, in terms of all sorts of different private interest groups and pressure groups. Um, but it's certainly true that if you're taking a lot of money from the EU, you need to make sure that money keeps coming in. So that means you need to make sure that whatever problem you've identified, whatever problem you, you exist to, to solve, 
that problem can never really go away, right? Or, no matter how much legislation is passed to, to sort these problems out, another problem is going to magically pop up and actually things are even worse than we thought they were and we're going to need even more money to deal with this. In addition to secure your money, you need to make sure that the EU is securing its money. So the EU budget can't go down because that means there's a chance that your budget may go down. And so when the EU budget was being um, debated three or four years ago, a whole plethora of these groups came out um, campaigning against any kind of cuts to the EU budget and indeed campaigning that um, it be increased. And just as a random sample, the European Youth Forum, which gets 82% of its money from the EU, said we call on member states not to freeze or cut the EU budget. Uh, Mental Health Europe, which gets 91%, said it opposes funding cuts. The European Women's Lobby, 83%, called for an ambitious budget. Concord, 51% funded, uh, warned that EU budget cuts could cost lives in developing countries. The European Movement, 71%, demanded increased investment. European Network for National Civil Society, 75%, said we believe in the value of better EU, blah, blah, and so on and so on. Um, you know, uh, to a man stood shoulder to shoulder with the EU, and indeed in, in most respects succeeded in having the budget at least frozen, and in many instances uh, actually increased. I mentioned that there isn't any need for the state to start funding these, let's call them AstroTurf groups, which is what you would do if it was business funding organizations to, to this kind of extent. Um, there wouldn't be any need to do that if these organizations were already fighting for popular causes. Uh, there wouldn't be any need to try and change public opinion because public opinion is already on their side. It's notable that of the most common political causes that these organizations fight for, they tend to be pretty unpopular. Now, again, leave aside your own views of these particular issues. It's just a fact that survey after survey shows that the, the general public are not that interested at best about them. Foreign aid consistently comes at the bottom of any list of what um, the, the electorate think government should be spending money on. Public health stuff, um, lifestyle regulation, hassling people about drinking, smoking, so on, people are generally at best ambivalent about. Climate change uh, consistently comes pretty low down in most people's view of priorities. And certainly when it comes to actually doing something about climate change, people's response to high energy prices and so on is always very um, negative. Identity politics of various kinds tend to be of only an interest to an academic elite. And the European Union itself, particularly over the last 10 years, um, has become um, increasingly unpopular. I mentioned that some of these things you may well actually agree with. There is one I haven't added on there, which um, as part of European citizenship, um, one of the great benefits of European citizenship that is put forward forward by pro-EU groups is the free movement of labour. Now, of course, one of the themes of this conference is the free movement of, of people and labour. Um, but it is equally true that a lot of EU money is used to push, um, to push and promote that. So not everything that um, these groups are, are fighting for are anti-libertarian or left-wing or, or anything of the sort. But again, I think it's really the principle of whether we need to be spending this kind of money promoting these causes or whether actually a genuine civil society which is funded by its members and staffed by volunteers could actually do the job just as well. Um, I'll just skip that because we're a little short for time I think now. One of my favorite areas of, um, of interest, lifestyle regulation, which is usually described as public health. Um, but in this particular instance, this EU conference in 2012, they actually did explicitly call it lifestyle regulation. So this is the conference for regulating, regulating lifestyle risks in Europe, the case of alcohol, tobacco, unhealthy diets and gambling. Um, I'm not sure how gambling is an unhealthy habit as such, but the event will be addressing the emerging policy and legal initiatives adopted across jurisdictions by focusing in particular on the role of the EU in developing lifestyle policies and regulations. Um, what does public health mean? Uh, it's a little Twitter exchange, I think, gives you a good idea of how many people in public health um, see it. Um, the uh, moniker here is, uh, or was, the head of the European Public Health Alliance, which in an earlier slide we saw get, I guess, about two thirds of its money from the EU. Um, chap at the top also works for a state funded public health group in Britain. And he's saying the latest major public health problems include Wonga, which is a company that 
gives payday loans to people. High-speed fruit machines, gambling machines, and the pornographication of girls and young men. Somebody's asked, how are these public health problems? Because all acts as determinants which lead to poorer health are those affected. To which the response is, well, that just means that anything which has a downside is a public health problem. To which she says, yeah, exactly. Every, everything which has any possible detrimental effect, which could impact health in any way, is a public health problem. So we're dealing much more here than um, you know, dealing with smoking or cholera or, or uh, sanitation. We're dealing with all sorts of lifestyle habits. I'll give you a few examples from the UK before giving you a few from the, from the EU. Um, these are all from the last few years. Uh, two of the big campaigns in public health in Britain over the last five years have been for plain packaging on tobacco and minimum pricing for alcohol. Minimum pricing means that the government sets the price below which a unit of alcohol cannot be sold. Um, and opinion polls have been fairly ambivalent about both of these policies. The, the, the public opinion is about 50-50 on minimum pricing. Plain packaging, public opinion was initially just about against and since then because of the campaign it's, it's been more in favour, but only about 60-40. The billboard you see here is for plain packaging and these went up all over Britain um, before the government voted on it and during a public consultation, uh, all paid for by, by the state. Uh, the government spent millions of pounds via the, the Department of Health campaigning for plain packaging. Um, but there's nothing on the, in contrast to the EU websites, there's nothing on there to let you know that this is being paid for by the taxpayers. It just looks, to all intents and purposes, yep. Sorry, just ask, what was the intention of this campaign actually? This campaign? Yeah, I don't understand. The idea is to remove all branding and colours from cigarette packs so they all look exactly the same and they just have a big image of... The government tried to convince people to support this idea or... Yeah, basically, yeah. This is, well, because at the time there was a public consultation. Um, they not needed to have kind of a referendum? No, 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 not a referendum. It's a public consultation it just asks so-called stakeholders to give their opinion. Anybody can respond to it. Okay, but, uh, Sorry. That's a fair question. Anyone can respond to it. Um, but it, no, it's, it's not a referendum. The MPs would vote on it. But it was a controversial issue. There's a good chance that lots of MPs would vote against it. And in the end, indeed, quite a few did, um, even after uh, all this campaigning. But um, the Department of Health ran the campaign, essentially, from, from day one. Um, similarly, this is a, quite an obscure one. But again, totally, uh, totally government funded. This is a supposed civil society organization that wants to ban the smoking being shown on television before nine o'clock at night to st save children from seeing somebody you know, using a cigarette. Uh, and again, they've got a website there, no indication on that website that it's state funded in any way. Uh, anybody who came across it would probably assume that this was just a voluntary group of concerned citizens. Uh, minimum pricing, again, a website here with no indication on it that it's uh, run by the state. Um, actively giving you all the reasons why you should support minimum pricing and indeed actually making a call to action, telling you to sign a petition, let your MP know that you're in favour of this particular policy. Uh, another organisation here, 100% funded by the government, also telling people to sign a petition, this time against alcohol advertising. Um, and. Uh, you have the power to bring change, but it won't happen overnight. An important first step is getting government to listen, uh, is contacting your MP. Let them know you're concerned about the impact of alcohol marketing on children. Your MP will raise the issue on your behalf, send them an email, and so on. Uh, and so there's all, all kinds of things like this. Um, at the EU level, the European Public Health Alliance, again, kind of an umbrella group, um, campaigns for all sorts of different things. Um, these are just a few examples. You may remember that Denmark tried out a fat tax uh, a few years ago, which was quickly dropped, um, but that didn't stop the EPHA campaigning for fat taxes. Not at the EU level, because the EU can't actually implement a fat tax properly, but uh, re pushing member states to go for a fat tax unilaterally. Similarly, campaigning for an EU ban on alcohol advertising. Actually, the EU can't have a total ban on alcohol advertising. It's not it's not one of their competences. Um, we're in a country right now which um, actually challenged the EU's attempt to have a total ban on 
tobacco advertising across Europe. Uh, tobacco advertising is most of its forms is banned across Europe, but not in, for example, German cinemas, uh, or not in um, German tobacconists or point of sale, because they are domestic issues um, which have no free trade implications. They have nothing to do with the internal market. So actually, the, the, the EU couldn't bring in, in a, a total ban on alcohol advertising, even if it wanted to. Uh, and then we see it here, of course, campaigning for um, uh, actually, actually just pushing for what the EU wanted to do anyway, which is the Tobacco Products Directive, which brings in all sorts of regulations about how how wide the d diameter of a cigarette can be and how big the warning has to be and all, all kinds of things. So it was a big cheerleader for that and other public health um, legislation at the EU level. One other example is the temperance movement. The temperance movement has never really gone away in Europe, um, but it's been dormant, I think it's safe to say, for most of the 20th century. Um, and it really only exists now thanks to EU funding and national government funding, but particularly EU funding. Um, the t temperance movement has kind of a bad reputation um, for obvious reasons. It's considered to be a kind of religious movement and uh, quite a puritanical movement. So the various temperance groups have changed their names over time, um, but there's always been a uh, uh, a lingering temperance movement, particularly in Scandinavia and in Britain. The International Order of Good Templars, which sounds kind of a, almost like a conspiracy um, organization, is actually just a temperance organization from the mid-19th century. Um, and they still, they're still around, just, they're now known as IOGT, um, and they've formed various offshoots which have more public health sounding names. So Eurocare, also known as the European Alcohol Policy Alliance, is a direct descendant of the International Order of Good Templars. They get a lot of money from the EU. Active Europe is their youth branch, and they get a huge amount of money from the EU. And in Britain, there's the Institute of Alcohol Studies, which was previously known as the UK Temperance Alliance, which was previously known as the UK Alliance for the Suppression of the Traffic in All Intoxicating Liquors. It was a totally prohibitionist organization in the 19th century, now known as the Institute of Alcohol Studies, which of course sounds much more academic and neutral on the issue, as if it's just a, a scientific question they're looking at. Um, and all these organizations push for a surprisingly traditional um, group of, of temperance policies. I mean, to look at what active Europe um, stand for, a total ban on alcohol marketing, um, a ban on selling alcohol in multiple packages, um, the uh, extension of the alcohol retail monopoly, which is seen in Sweden, for example, to be across the whole of Europe, uh, to reduce the number of places you can buy alcohol, to bring in minimum taxes on alcohol, um, to have plain packaging for alcohol, essentially, um, uh, to ban the home, home brewing of alcohol and so on. A um, whole load of things, which very few people are campaigning for, except government-funded temperance groups. Um, I'll just finish with a, a, a couple of questions and maybe a solution. Um, the EU's justification for giving so much money to pressure groups, and they've made this explicitly in the instance of um, giving a lot of money to environmental groups, is that EU politicians are constantly being bombarded by corporate interests, and there's not enough funding for the public interest groups, and therefore the state funding is redressing the balance. I think that's fallacious. I think it's certainly true that corporate interests do a lot of lobbying and, and maybe have, um, or almost certainly have, excessive influence at Brussels. But then Brussels does kind of attract lobbyists. If you're going to have a huge, a huge government, then you're going to attract a huge amount of lobbying. What I think is, is wrong to assume is that you're redressing the balance. Um, there is no such thing as a public interest. That's the important thing. There is clearly corporate interests, and they may sometimes be in the public interest and may, may not be, but there isn't a public interest per se. There are merely special interest groups. And what the EU has done is it's picked special interest groups that it likes, it's given them money, and basically said to them, you go off, you start lobbying MEPs, you start campaigning amongst the electorate, you get a groundswell of support for your cause, because really, it's also our cause. Why would they... Why would they do it otherwise, unless they were sympathetic to these um, causes? Um, and and the, the other question is, you know, why would the EU government 
or any government be funding groups which oppose what that government stands for? Why, why is EU funding so many organisations which campaign against, against TTIP, for example? Why is the EU funding something like the European Public Health Alliance, which is campaigning for minimum pricing, which is actually illegal under EU law? almost certainly. Why is it campaigning for the EU to do things it can't do? Um, and I think the explanation for that is, goes back to my original point, that the, the government is not the state. Um, there are plenty of people within the state who don't necessarily agree with what the state stands for, or certainly disagrees with part of what the state stands for. So just because the EU is a free trade area doesn't mean that everybody within it actually believes in, in free trade. and in many on, on, on certain issues that clearly do not believe in free trade and are happy to um, fund organizations which are very openly um, anti-free trade and in some instances kind of anti-EU in that sense. Um, what can any of you do about this? I think there's, there's a couple of things. Um, one is just publicize it, you know, look, look into who, who's getting money from the EU. One of the great things about the EU is they are pretty transparent on, on this. There is a transparency register. Anybody who lobbies in the EU is likely to be on this register. You just type in their name and it'll show you how much money they're getting from the national government and from the EU government. And let people know about it because my experience writing about this for several years is people are amazed. Um, not just at the scale of the funding, but that the funding exists at all. They just can't understand why private charities, private pressure groups are getting taxpayers' money. Um, and the other thing to sort of give a plug, I guess, to something that we're doing at the Institute of Economic Affairs is engage with the EU, EU yourself. The EU is actually pretty genuine to a large extent on wanting to engage with people. And if it's not genuine, it's certainly put out enough signals to make it feel pressure to engage if you go to them. Now, it's debatable whether libertarian organizations should take money from the government. Some people would say that there could be nothing more hypocritical. I, I tend to agree with that. Other people would say that if libertarians aren't taking the money, if they're entitled to it, it'll only go to a subconscious socialist. Um, leaving that aside, I don't actually think that you need to um, be taking money from the EU to engage with it. We at the IEA have helped set up something called Epicenter, which is a um, coalition of free market think tanks in Europe, um, and we are trying to be the voice of the free market in Brussels. If you're interested in that, go to the IEA stand and see Christiana, she'll be happy to tell you more about it. But anybody can get together and be a genuine civil society organization, and the EU is almost obliged, at least, to pay lip service to you, at the very least, uh, and to engage with you. Because at the moment, the EU is dominated by civil society groups that don't generally believe in free markets, don't generally believe in personal liberty, um, and as a result, we're getting um, a, an anti-trade, anti-liberty liberty agenda uh, arising, um, not only from Brussels, but also from many national governments. Right, I will leave it there. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. I would like to give you oh, a thank you very much. certificate. <laughs> Is there any questions? I see one over there in the third row. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't really go through these. Uh, I mean, the, the easiest solution to this, and I have spoken to politicians who say, I agree with you about this, what can we do? And I'm thinking, well, I work for a think tank, you're in power. I mean, just stop giving them the money, right? That's the most obvious thing to do. Just stop giving them the money. It would be quite nice if some primary legislation could be put in place saying the government will not fund political activism. That would be ideal. Um, but at the very least, any individual government should just do an audit across government and you'd be surprised. Ministers don't know this is going on most of the time. If you control a, a budget of £100 billion, as our health minister does, there's just no way he's going to know about some website being set up for five grand promoting minimum pricing. They don't know about it. They're often appalled. The Queensland solution uh, refers to um, something that happened in the Australian state of Queensland a couple of years ago. They just brought in a rule saying that um, no organization that gets more than 50% of its money from the government is allowed to campaign or lobby. And some groups said, oh, this is an infringement of our free speech and blah, blah, blah. But, and I think you do need to be wary about the free speech issue, but I think that's actually a pretty fair rule. I think if you're 
getting most of your money from the government, you are, generally speaking, a wing of the government. And in the same way as you wouldn't expect a civil servant to lobby and campaign, indeed quite the opposite, you would expect silence from a civil servant, then uh, anybody which is mainly funded by the government shouldn't be able to do it. Subsequent to that in Australia, when Tony Abbott came in, he actually just did the most obvious thing, which in the first week, he just took away money from any organisation he didn't like. Not as many as I would like, but various organisations who we could see were going to give him a headache, that were full of leftists, he just said, no more money for you. And that was it. There was a bit of kicking and squealing for a few days, but very quickly it was forgotten about. Okay, the guy who asked before. <laughs> The shell. Uh, no, I have the impression that the, the more we speak about uh, civil society, the less civil society we have. Uh, when I see this uh, bullshit and that uh, uh, when some uh, organizations uh, fully are uh, sponsored by uh, 70 by the government or European Union and they call themselves the NGOs or uh, uh, government of the European uh, Union uh, said that uh, civil society is the core of the modern state uh, and, um, well, and this is a, such a bullshit um, why uh, the government of the European Union don't want to leave simply more money in uh, the citizens pockets to actually uh, celebrate the civil society uh, and to just try to redistribute uh, public money into the selected organizations. What do you think about that? Sorry, I didn't quite get the question. I mean, the question is why um, the European Union or the national governments simply don't want to lower taxes and to boost the civil society and, and to, rather, rather than uh, redistributing money and giving them into uh, selected, uh, selected organization pockets. Yeah, well, I mean, a number of national governments would like to give less money to the EU. Um, uh, the last negotiations, I think at least 12 national governments were campaigning to, to give the EU less money. And they failed partly because you had hundreds of NGOs screaming that this was going to cost lives in some way or this was going to result in the, the meltdown of, of society. Um, the EU has no incentive at all to want lower taxes. Some national governments do for their own either ideological reasons or perfectly sound ideological reasons or because um, it's electorally popular and the EU is not particularly electorally popular. Um, but the EU has no incentive at all to want lower taxes and it has every incentive to fund organisations particularly if they're going to be pro-EU but also if they're going to support their other agendas and also the, the extension of the EU agenda. This is one thing I didn't mention. A lot of these groups are pushing for the EU to have more powers in, in new areas. Um, for tax, taxation being one, you know, there should be EU taxes and if there were EU taxes of course then that would secure their funding more, more easily and there would be less need. For, um, for all this negotiation. So the EU is constrained in many, many ways. Uh, I think people sometimes exaggerate its powers. Its competences are, are limited in many respects. But there's a lot of these so-called NGOs pushing for the, um, for, for, the bar you know, for the frontiers to be um, moved forward. Okay, thank you very much. We don't have any more time for any more questions. So thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you. You can, you can download either of these, if you just Google them, you, you can download the PDF for free. Um, you may find the Europe of its one in particular interest. Giga T. Crowdfunding for you and me.